Good evening, and welcome to our Monday Thursday service at Christ Reformed United Church of Christ. The Seder meal that begins the Passover begins with a question that says, why is this night different from every other night? When the youngest child asks that question, that begins an evening of, of sharing food and also of memory, of remembering and dreaming, a time of worshiping and confessing. If I were to ask you that question, why is tonight different than every other night, the answer would be obvious. We're at our homes. We're not worshiping in this sanctuary. We're not able to be together to share a meal at all. We, we have to be only isolated from those people we know and love with those people we know and love and separated from our friends. We can't touch each other. We can't come together in the sanctuary on a Sunday morning or a Thursday night and pass bread and communion elements to each other. And so this is a night that's different than every other night, but maybe not completely different because the same spirit that has drawn Christians together for millennia is the one that draws us together, the same purpose to be together. The same power that, that enables us to overcome the, the obstacles in our life, the challenges we face in our lives. That same power is present even though we are dispersed. And the same presence that we will remember in when we share bread and cup is the same presence that Jesus offered to his disciples 2,000 years ago when they last ate in that upper room. We welcome you to worship today. Let us lift our voices and prayers to God. Welcoming God, we gather tonight and worship to praise you. A few of us are in the sanctuary, this sacred place where over many generations our forebears have gathered to worship God. Many more are gathered together electronically, watching and worshiping from the place they called home. Wherever we are, O oh God, you hear our prayers, our sighs, our doubts, and all our fears. We give you our thanks for your loving awareness and care of us all. We join together to proclaim the truth that grace is greater than sin, that light dispels darkness and life overcomes death. We offer our gifts of praise and thankfulness to you, O oh God. Amen. Hear these words from the Gospel of Mark. <clears throat> On the first day of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb was sacrificed, his disciples said to him, where do you want us to go and make the pre pre preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples saying to them, go into the city and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. And wherever he enters, say to the owner of the house, the teacher asked, where is thy guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? 
He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. So the disciples set out and went to the city and found everything as he told them, and they prepared the Passover meal. This is a time when we are all too aware of the, the struggles around the globe uh, of people who are suffering with a terrible pandemic. And it's, it's easy to lose track of the individual stories. If you watch the news or you read the newspaper, you, you get some of those stories, those individual characters who are, are fighting the disease with all their talent and strength and energy. And you see those people who are perhaps losing their battle against it and their families are grieving. It's a, a very personal story. It's not just a global story. And tonight, as we come to a time of prayer, I want to invite you to remember those individuals. And within our church, I would ask you to remember a few people who are particularly struggling at this time. Brenda Fogel's mother uh, suffered a stroke this week, and so we lift up prayers for her. Dick Holter has been in and out of the hospital, and Dick is now uh, take, taking a turn for the worse. And please hold Dick in your thoughts and prayers. And David Fry, uh, who has been battling cancer for some time, had treatment this last week, which unfortunately sent him back to the hospital, some of the after effects. So hold them in your prayers. And anyone else, as we gather together a time when we remember God's love for even those, especially those who are suffering the most. Let us pray. O oh, gracious God, as those who strive to follow Jesus in our living and to trust your power in our dying, we gather to reflect upon the life that ended on a cross. Isolated, enslaved by fears and anxieties, wondering what the next day would bring, though gathered in the homes in Egypt, some alone, some together on that night so long ago, for a meal which they didn't understand and in a moment would change them forever. Fearful, worried, isolated from their families, friends, and neighbors, by events beyond their imagination, they gathered in an upper room in Jerusalem so, so long ago for a meal they thought they understood, but which you transformed that night. Jesus, who knelt to serve them, to prepare for them in that moment, a moment that would change them forever. On this night, isolated, alone, held captive by fears we don't understand, separated from neighbors, co-workers, friends, and families. Yet we gather, scattered as we are, drawing near to one another in your heart. Spirit of God, we ask you to hold us close. With your whispers of grace, remind us that you are transforming the world and all who are in it. Those nights long ago, this night, every night, O oh God, with our ancestors who dared to believe, who lived through their fears and doubts, we offer our lives to you. Take those lives, our lives, our strengths and our weaknesses, our faith and our foolishness. Mold them into something resembling your Son and our Savior, Jesus, who taught his friends to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you. 
I think one of the best sermons I ever prepared and delivered happened this week. It was earlier this week. It wasn't on Sunday morning. It was actually Wednesday morning, about 1.30 in the morning. Um, I'm not sure what gave rise to it, but I was, I was brilliant. I was just wonderful, very articulate and m much different than I normally am. Uh, it could have been the warm room that we were in. It was a night when a, a hot storm was brewing and we didn't want to leave the windows open, so it was kind of hot in the house. It also could have been the, the COVID virus uh, news and all the restrictions it places on us, the fact that we can't go anywhere, we, we can't get together with friends, we can't go out for a meal, we can't do those things that are normally so much a part of our life. Maybe that triggered it. And it's also in a bit of a pity party, I guess, in the middle of the night. I was also thinking, this is a heck of a way to end uh, ministry at the church here, you know, next couple of months. We don't know what it'll bring. And, and so I was sort of feeling a little sad that I was missing all of you, members of the congregation, friends, those relationships and those times we have together. That'll take care of itself. But I think what really tripped off that sermon that night was the news at about 9.20. As I was sitting on the couch, I got a, an alert from New York Times on my phone, and it said that John Prine had died. Now, those of you who know and love John Prine can understand this, and for those who don't, I, I understand that. You've probably heard more in the last 48 hours than you care to ever hear about John Prine, this uh, singer-songwriter who is something of an acquired taste, I must confess, for a lot of us. Uh, John was a, a brilliant writer, but he was somebody who had uh, marginal uh, music skills. He once uh, said, I learned three chords and I stopped there because I figured that was enough. And really, that's what he did. He did more with a pen, pen and a piece of paper and, a, and a three chords than anybody ever could. John was a remarkable songwriter. He was not much of a singer. His voice was okay. Well, but about 25 years ago, this okay voice took a turn when he suffered uh, cancer. He had surgery and the surgery damaged his lung, his, rather his vocal cords. So what was a marginal voice became a bit more gravelly, maybe had more gravitas, actually. And then about seven years ago, he had some surgery to remove a tumor on his lung, and that left the voice even more limited. But still, it was the perfect instrument for doing what he did best, and that was to write stories of people, write stories of events and, and things he observed. That's what his ability was, his, his way to look at things and, and notice the things that were around him. You know, when he talked about being a, a student in school, he was a lousy student, he said, when the teacher was up at the bulletin board, um, writing on the board, all the students were looking up at the board. He said, I looked at the scuffs on her shoes, and I began to create stories. Where did those come from? How did those things happen? And he did that throughout his life. He wrote stories and, and wrote songs that were silly and powerful, that were witty and scary, uh, depressing, and, and ultimately a life-affirming, life-giving. And so I, I really was struck when John died. In his early adulthood, uh, the reason he wrote so many songs was uh, he uh, had a lot of time on his hands. He was a mailman in Illinois, and uh, he said it was a pretty monotonous job. And so as he traveled around the, the neighborhood delivering these mails, he said, I had a lot of room to offer all sorts of ideas and chase them down the, the pathways of my mind. He said that gave him a powerful opportunity to, uh, to think about those people and events that he observed during his day. He wrote one time, you just sit and look around you. You don't have to make up stuff. If you just try to take down the bare description of what's going on and not try to over-describe something, then it leaves space for the reader or the listener to fill in their experience with it, and they become part of it. Now, I should say, before we go on too much further, I am going to get to Jesus eventually, I promise. But I'm thinking about the theme of, of Corona of Friends, a gathering of, of friends, uh, that crown of friends we, we have around us that we are probably most aware that we're missing today. Uh, the, the friends that we can only connect with by phone or internet or email or, or through Zoom or other means like this. Well, when I thought about Prine and I began to put this sermon together, I went to one of these toolboxes that I love to use and I started to turn to a book by Fred Craddock called Craddock Stories. Craddock, as you all know, as I've told you any number of times, is, is a preacher's preacher. He was a, a preacher himself and also became a teacher of preachers in Atlanta at a seminary. And Craddock did a, a collection, or they did a collection of his stories that he told through his ministry. He had such an incredible ability to observe life and draw out of it the truth. And I said that was what struck me about Prine. Both Prine and Craddock had this amazing ability to look at the same things we all look at, but see the, the deep and, and resonant truths that are just beneath the surface. And they did it in a way that was unique, of course. One of the things about Prine is that when uh, he had his surgeries, he... Um, he, uh, his neck kind of pulled to one side, and, and so you look at him in his later years, and he's kind of tilted off to the side, and I thought, I think that's the way he always, uh, always looked at life. You know, his head tilted to the side only after his mind had already tilted. His songs were always tilted, a little bit askew. That's how he saw the world. 
And for Craddock, it was not so much a tilting of the head, but it was his size. I met him a number of years ago at a, a conference I went to. He was leading the conference, and we had a chance to study with each other. And this was in the pre-YouTube days, so I'd never seen him before. I'd read his works, of course, and, and I knew him to be this luminary in the preaching world. And I, I presumed him to be this big, strong, imposing man. It turns out this little, tiny guy with a very high, squeaky voice was the one who came and began to deliver his message. And it was a powerful message indeed, but his voice was no match for what his, his authority was. It would seem an odd assortment. So one of the things that I think about Prine, or rather about Craddock, was that it was his size. You know, Craddock was very short. And I have a feeling he looked up at the world a lot. You know, and that, he never looked down on people, psychologically, intellectually, spiritually. He always looked up to them and looked for the wisdom that could flow from them. He looked at the obvious events of his life and sought the, the truths that come from this. And I think this is where we get to Jesus, because Jesus did the same thing in his life. Jesus was all about relationships. When you talk about the, the stories in the Bible, you think about the healing on the Sabbath. It wasn't so much the rules that he was concerned with. It was the man who needed to be healed. It didn't matter the, the religious restrictions that were part of it. It was simply a desire to heal somebody who was, who was hindered by something in their lives. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about the man who was healed at the pool of Siloam, the blind man who was given back his sight. Jesus appears at the beginning of the story and the end of the story. But in the middle, everybody's caught up with just the questions of who caused this man to be blind? Was it his father's? Was it his sin? Whose was it? Jesus wasn't concerned about what caused the sin. He was caused, caused the blindness. He was concerned about healing this encumbrance this man lived with, the blindness that was part of his life. Jesus was an amazing observer of life. Remember the, the story that Jesus, and I think it's in Luke's gospel, where the woman who had been bleeding for a long time walks by Jesus. He doesn't notice her, but he touched, she touches the hem of his garment, and she's healed. He didn't have to say anything, didn't have to do anything, it's just the presence. He, he somehow knew this woman to be need, needing to be healed, and he did that. There's also the story of the widow of Nain who, who was in a, a burial procession. And before he even uh, had a chance to talk to her, he looked at the woman and said, do not weep. And, uh, and she was healed, or rather her son was raised from the dead by Jesus' power. She, even before anybody said anything, he had this amazing ability to look through uh, the events of, of going on around him. And, uh, and bring about the truth and the strength out of them. His stories and his lives were, were uh, dangerous sometimes, and they sometimes were very direct. Sometimes he could be uh, deadly serious. Remember when he talked to the Pharisees and said, you brood of vipers, who, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? And you think about, he could be silly, you know? Uh, uh, you know, it's harder for a camel to get through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to get into heaven. He never looked down on people. He looked at the events, and he could be wise without being pedantic, without being too uh, intellectual with them, without badgering them in the position. He simply brought out from the experiences of his life the truth and the strength that was needed. He could be silly and playful. Uh, think about the child sitting on his lap who he's trying to teach the disciples need to be more like children as they come to faith. Or he could be dangerous. You just have to ask the money changers who are at the temple. All the while, it was the relationships that were essential to Jesus. And as we know, sometimes relationships can go south. Sometimes we can have trouble in our relationships. Think about the reason we're gathering tonight. Uh, the, the Monday, Thursday event is the recalling of that last night when Jesus last ate with his disciples. When they gathered in the upper room, they were all aware of, of what was going on, but he was aware of what was going on within them. When he looked at Judas, he could see Judas' betrayal in the way that Judas' eyes maybe darted around the room. He could feel or sense of Peter's denial of him, even before Peter could, could dream that that was possible. By the way, Peter kind of hung his head when he talked to Jesus. He knew there was something about him that was wrong and was not right, and, and that they failed him. That's flat, plain and simple what happened. In the end, they failed him. Well, you know, that's something we do with our friends as well, isn't it? Sometimes we, we fail them in ways that are large and sometimes in small. And these times, particularly, we fail them uh, simply because we're so caught up with the fear and the anxiety that's part of our society today. I think the fears we have are ones that Jesus can look through because he's not put off by our failures or our sins. You know, he sees the, the sin of fear as we begin to hoard things to make sure we have enough. It doesn't matter that somebody else might not have enough. He sees the pride that causes us to, to do dangerous things with our lives, to go places despite the government's telling us not to, to become a danger to ourselves and other people. He sees the suspicion that leads us to believe others are conspiring somehow to cause this problem to us or for our nation. 
Though we don't desert him, or though we desert him and fail him, he does not desert us. And that, I think, is the heart of why we're gathering here tonight. Again and again, he does not deny us. I think that's why we sing often in church that wonderful song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, All Our Sins and Griefs to Bear. Tonight's night, uh, Monday, Thursday, comes from a, a Latin word, mandatum, which means uh, love one another, mandate. Um, Jesus gave to his disciples to love one another as I have loved you. Friends, love one another as we have loved, been loved by Jesus. Amen. We gather tonight in the manner that Jesus gathered with his disciples, not in a sanctuary, not in a, a religious edifice, not in a chapel somewhere, a religious place, but rather in a home. You are literally in your home when you're watching this. And that seems appropriate because what we're doing tonight is re reuniting ourselves with each other, even though we're apart, like we are sitting around a table at a Passover meal. You may be in your home tonight, but you are not alone. The Spirit of God that, that gave you life and drew this church together every Sunday for 275 years is still drawing us together electronically uh, by the Spirit of Christ. The cup that the, the disciples shared is the cup of, of hope that Jesus gave them. Tell me, joy of gladness, the cup of, of thanksgiving that uh, they shared in time. The bread that they shared was the bread of, of, of release from slavery, whether it was slavery to fears or doubts. And I think we need both of those things tonight. We need both the release from those things that, that hinder us, and we need the joy that comes from knowing we do not need to fear. Now, just as uh, that light, not that time long ago, uh, the disciples had sort of gotten away of the message Jesus was trying to share with them, we need to acknowledge there are places where we have done the same thing. We get in the way of the grace that God seeks to give us. And so as we come to this time, we need to ask ourselves the question, will we continue to fear, or will we give over our fears to God? Will we continue to separate ourselves from the one who seeks to embrace us by separating ourselves not only uh, by religion, but, but just by our physical presence, by our refusal to participate in the community of faith that God calls us to? Or will we welcome God into our lives? In a moment, I ask, in this moment of quiet, I ask you to simply pray silently and offer up your answer to that prayer, uh, the question whether you're going to be full of fear or you can give over your fears to God. Let us pray. On this loneliest of nights, when we're separated, on this holiest nights, when we're united, we give thanks that God is not put off by any distance we have from each other or we feel from him. God loves us, redeems us, and sustains us this day and every day. Amen. We remember on the night when Jesus last ate with his disciples, he gave them a, a, a word of strength that would enable them to understand that love will overcome hate, that life will overcome death. Amidst the meal, he took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In like manner, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant, which is in my blood. This do as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Loving God, we come to this place now humble, acknowledging we are not worthy to be here. Yet you have welcomed us still. You all call us friends. God, and we give you thanks for that. Help us to reach through the, the space that we experience physically and, and hold each other tight in this time. Let us nourish each other with thoughts and prayers and, and feelings. And help us, O oh God, to, to support this relationship through the sharing of this meal. In the homes where people are living and sharing this meal tonight, O oh God, unite them in a, in a prayer of, of thanksgiving for the blessings they have that they are safe at home. Take the elements of bread and cup and transform them into the healing balm that we so need to solve the pandemic and plagues all of us, not just a disease of the body, but of the spirit. We ask your blessing on this meal tonight. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now, typically, when we gather and worship here, I would invite people to pass trays, or you would come up front and gather food together for yourself, the, the bread and the cup. You can't do that, but I invite you, wherever you are, if you have made some of the matzo this week, or if you have uh, found a piece of bread, or if there's a cracker nearby, you can use that, because it's really not the vehicle that's important, it's the truth. 
and that is that uh, we are redeemed by God's grace and love. And as you offer that to each other, I would invite you to look at them. Look at them in the eyes, you know, connect with them as, as your friend and, and loved one, and say, this is Christ's body. This is the heavenly bread. Do that, and uh, as you do that with each other, it'll be a powerful experience. I think this is Christ's body. This is Christ, the bread of heaven. And in like manner, if you are watching us by yourself, if you uh, are home by yourself, all you need to do is lift up the bread before the screen and, and look through the camera, look through the, the screen you see. And think about those, you can close your eyes if you want and envision those people, those loved ones, those family members who aren't with you this day, or perhaps people that need love more than anything else, and say the same thing to them. This is the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Let us give thanks to God as we share this communion. This is the bread of Christ, the body of Christ, the bread of heaven given for you, taken it. This is a cup of forgiveness poured out for the forgiveness of the sins. Take and drink all. Let us pray. O oh Lord, we pause at the end of this meal to offer thanks to you, O oh God. When these long days and nights of isolation are over and we are once again gathered at your people, we will join our hearts and voices together, singing our praise of you. But for now, just for tonight, this is enough. We have been fed by your spirit, tasting your presence in these simple elements. Bless us that as we leave this table, we may become blessings to others in your name and for your sake. Amen. After the meal, um, Jesus and his disciples um, wondered what was next. They sang a hymn. Jesus was feeling the need for comfort and solace because he knew what was going to transpire in the coming hours. He knew these hours would bring about a great tragedy for his life. So they sang together, and then they went out to a garden where they began to pray. And uh, I invite you to remember the story of Jesus and the disciples as they went to the Garden of Gethsemane.
And they came to a place which was called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. And he took Peter and James and John with him a little further into the garden. And he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. Wait here and watch. And he went by himself and fell on the ground and prayed, Father, all things are possible with you. If it be possible, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down on the ground. And he rose, and he came to his disciples, and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch with me one hour? And he returned three times, and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. And when they had come the third time, he said, Get up, for he who will betray me is at hand. Then Judas came straight to Jesus, and said, Hail, Master! And kissed him. And they came forward, laid hands on Jesus, and took him. Then all his disciples forsook him and fled. On this night, when we remember death of Jesus, which would happen the next day, on this night when we remember death every time we turn on the television or, or read the newspaper, the good news is the light comes into the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it. So go this night with a sense of joy, knowing that Christ goes with us this night and every night. Amen. <laughs>